Well, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining us for our 2022 Federal Forum. Uh, as you know, this has been uh, started in the last couple of years and has been a wonderful opportunity to talk to some of our leaders, hear what they have to say and ask questions uh, about some of the things that we may want to know of them. So today, uh, my name is Jeff Phillips. I am your 2022 Southland Regional President. And I have the distinct opportunity and pleasure to introduce our moderator for the day. Uh, today, our moderator is Nancy Starzik. She is a longtime Governmental Affairs Committee member and a past president of Southland Regional. She is the CAR director, CAR, for those of you that are going to beat me up on that one, and an NAR director, and travels to DC uh, to make our Hill visits. She is the co-key contact for CA, uh, I'm sorry, CA Assembly member Suzette Valadares and Supervisor Catherine Barger. <laughs> Additionally, she is a federal political coordinator for our Congressman Mike Garcia. Nancy received the 2022 San Fernando Valley Business Journal's Top 200 Most Influenced People in the category of real estate and is recognized both locally and statewide for her community influence. With all of that, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you, Nancy, for all your hard work and for putting this together today. And I'd like to turn over the meeting to you. Thank you, President Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, and again, this is our second federal forum, so we're excited to get be to begin. Um, and I'd like to start, if you don't mind, by introducing and acknowledging a few people. Um, uh, we have um, invited guests from the California Association of Realtors, Sean Bellick, Matt Roberts, and Christian Heuschreck. Um, and I'd also like to say that we are joined by other associations, not just Southland Regional. We have the Greater Los Angeles Association, Pasadena Foothills, Burbank, Glendale, Conejo Simi Moore Park, and Greater Antelope Valley all participating. So they're not on camera, but they're listening in. So we are honored to be joined today by our federal representatives, Congressman Brad Sherman, who is right here, and Congressman Mike Garcia. And we have videos that we're gonna start with uh, from Senator Alex Padilla and Congressman Tony Cardenas. So thank you, each of you and your staff members for joining us. So um, I'd like to make a quick introduction uh, so that you know who the members are and your key contacts. Mel Wilson is here, Mel, you can wave, who is our key contact for US Senator Alex Padilla. He is our legislative housing advocate, and he also received the 2022 San Fernando Valley Business uh, Journal's top most, 200 top most influential people in the category of real estate. Alice McCain, give a wave, Alice. Uh, she is the co uh, key contact for Congressman Brad Sherman, actually federal political coordinator. And uh, uh, Loretta Martin is federal political coordinator for Tony Cardenas, Congressman Tony Cardenas, who um, he has sent us the message via a video. And then I am the federal political coordinator for Congressman Garcia, who is here as well. So uh, just let's see, we want to, Elizabeth, can you start those videos for us? They're about two minutes each. So you'll get to hear from them. They were unable to be with us today. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla. And I want to thank you, the Southland Regional Association of Realtors, for inviting me to join you at your second annual virtual forum on housing issues. It's an honor to speak to you all today. Now let's face it, it's an important time to be together. The country's facing a shortage of 6.8 million affordable homes for working families. More than a half a million people are experiencing homelessness each year in the United States. And over the last several years, despite increased investments to confront this crisis, over 160,000 people still experience homelessness on any given day in California. Now, I've been talking to people throughout the state about the need for housing solutions since my time on the Los Angeles City Council. In fact, my elementary school, Telfer Elementary in Pacoima, has one of the highest rates of students experiencing homelessness in the entire Los Angeles Unified School District. So yes, this issue is personal to me. And after two years of a global health pandemic, which has increased the strain on families struggling to afford a home, 
the urgency to address this crisis has never felt stronger. In 2021, I was proud to help pass the American Rescue Plan, which included over $21 billion in emergency rental assistance and investments in fair housing. It also funded nearly $10 billion in direct mortgage assistance to avoid foreclosures and evictions. Yet too many Californians continue to struggle to pay their bills and can't achieve the dream, the American dream of home ownership. So I'll continue to support policies at the federal level that keep us building homes, increasing home ownership, and to help solve our housing crisis. Now I want you to know that I'm monitoring interest rates as well, as the Federal Reserve is working to temper inflation, including by speaking with leaders like Chairman Powell. You know better than I do, interest rates are key to mortgage rates, which are key to how much home buyers qualify for. You know, the strength of our economy and the vibrancy of all communities depends on access to housing. And I'm so thankful for your partnership and for your willingness to come together to confront these important issues. Because every person has a right to the dignity and security of housing. And we can't stop until they get it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Congressman Tony Gavinas, and I'm proud to represent California's 29th district right here in the San Fernando Valley. First, I'd like to thank the South Bend Regional Association of Realtors for bringing us together to discuss an issue that's important to all of us, home ownership. Owning a home is part of the American dream, and there are many benefits to home ownership. When you own a home, you're able to build wealth for the next generation or for your precious retirement or both. But if we want to make the dream of owning a home a reality for more families, we need to address affordability. This is especially true for low and moderate income, first time and first generation home buyers. I'm working in Congress to relieve housing cost burdens and ensure families have the opportunity to own a home. That includes supporting policies like the earned income tax credit and other federal credits and deductions that make owning a home more affordable. With my vote, the House passed the Build Back Better Act, which includes strong investments in affordable housing and directs billions of dollars to home ownership. These are programs that include $10 billion to help first-time, first-generation home buyers secure a home, $5 billion to help subsidize 20-year mortgages for first-generation home buyers, and much more. This will provide over $2 billion to build additional affordable homes right here in California. As a former realtor and small business owner myself, I'm committed to continuing the fight and working to ensure that these investments make it across the finish line. We must expand home ownership opportunities, incentivize the construction of additional affordable homes, and give all families the key to the American dream of home ownership. Thank you again for inviting me to join you today. I look forward to continuing our work together to serve the people of the San Fernando Valley and the region and California's 29th Congressional District. I want to say thank you to Loretta and to Mel for securing those videos. And I'd like to make a quick correction. Christian Hoishrad is with NAR, and we also have, have Helen Devlin from NAR with us. So uh, I would like to introduce our moderators for this morning, um, Bob Kalsa and Patty Petrelia. They're going to talk about some of the issues that the realtors are working on and that we support, and that we're going to discuss this with our representatives that are here today, Congressman Sherman and Congressman Garcia. So if the two of you would be kind enough to limit your answers to five minutes, if you can do it, we would appreciate that because we have several questions we want to get through. So I'm going to be turning it over to uh, Bob and Patty, but before I do, I'd like to introduce Bob. He's a longtime member of our Government Affairs Committee, and he works in both residential and commercial real estate. He is a CAR state director. He travels to DC for our Hill visits as well, and he is the key contact for all of the city council members for Santa Clarita Valley City or Santa Clarita City. And then Patty Petrelia is also a longtime Government Affairs Committee member and a past president of Southland Regional. She is a CAR director and travels to DC also for Hill visits. She is the co-key uh, contact for uh, Senator Bob Hertzberg and Los Angeles City Council member Nuri Martinez. 
So uh, we're going to start with Mr. Kalsa, and we will have you take it away. Thank you, Nancy. The state and local tax, referred to as SALT, permits taxpayers who itemize when filing federal taxes to deduct certain taxes paid to state and local governments. Currently, the tax code penalizes many families who file joint tax returns. The maximum state and local tax deduction is limited to $10,000, whether for filing single or jointly, effectively penalizing family formation. The realtors strongly support the elimination of this marriage penalty by doubling the maximum deduction cap to $20,000 for joint returns, as well as indexing the cap for inflation. Thank you both for co-sponsoring HR 613 SUSI, the SALT deductibility tax. Can you each tell us your thought on SALT fairness and deductibility? And first I'll go to Congressman Sherman, let's start with you. Thank you. I'm Brad Sherman from America's best name city, Sherman Oaks. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to work with uh, the Southland Realtors even before Southland Realtors was Southland Realtors. I've been working with you for a long time. Uh, I've taken the lead in pushing for a higher conforming loan limit for high cost areas. And we now have that $978,000 limit. The next step is to make sure that those who are getting qualified loans, but it's over the, uh, you know, it's, a high, a, uh, it's in a high cost area are not subject to discriminatory G fees. We have to convince Fannie and Freddie that, that conforming means conforming. There's no such thing as conforming, but subject to an additional fee. And that's just basic fairness. If you want to buy a home in, uh, in Omaha and you're paying $647,000, you are getting an enormous home. You buy a home in the San Fernando Valley for nine seventy eight. dollars it's going to be a nice home. It's not necessarily going to be an enormous home. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, to work with you uh, on, uh, I'm already a co-sponsor of every bill that NAR is pushing. That includes the uh, Housing Supply and Affordability Act, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, uh, the Housing Fairness uh, Act, the Greater Revitalization of uh, Shopping Centers Act, and uh, the Revitalizing Downtowns Act. So uh, with my uh, uh, seat, I'm now uh, the number three Democrat on the Financial Services Committee. Uh, I'm in a position uh, to push all of this legislation forward. Uh, I was the author of the Home Buyers Assistance Act, uh, which uh, we now have gotten through the House of Representatives by putting it in, believe it or not, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, it's amazing how a... Uh, one bill can then tag on with another. I want to thank uh, NAR uh, for uh, uh, for their support. We now have it through the House, but we have to make sure that Republican senators don't bounce it out for this or that reason. Uh, this is a common sense piece of legislation that simply uh, says that if you're getting an FHA loan, you need uh, a, an appraiser who's qualified, but an appraiser who can be uh, if they're qualified for Fannie and Freddie, they're qualified for FHA. I want to thank uh, Republican Dan Taylor for being my Republican lead on that. So uh, I look forward to dealing uh, with uh, specifics. Um, the uh, couple bills I want to mention, of course, is that I've co-sponsored the Neighborhood uh, Homes uh, Investment Act, uh, which establishes a new business-related uh, tax credit uh, for uh, certain eligible uh, uh, investments in affordable housing. Uh, it is limited to 35% of what is invested or 80% of the national uh, medium sale price for new homes and uh, deals with single family homes uh, containing uh, four or fewer residential units. So uh, I look forward to dealing with specific questions. Uh, I, they've asked me to limit myself to five minutes and that's what I've done. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, and, and you made references to the to the shopping center and the downtown revitalization act. I'm going to come back to that, uh, Congressman uh, Garcia. Your comments on salt? Yeah, I'll uh, actually address the question. Uh, the salt cap. And, uh, and, and, first, of and, 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 and I didn't address salt. I'm very much in favor. Of <laughs> there you go, Brad. Well, I'll uh, I'll yield to my colleague uh, Brad if you want to talk about salt. Go ahead. 
just uh, its its basic fairness. Uh, it was taken away uh, from us by those who thought that, well, if you take away the state and local tax deduction, uh, there were uh, think tanks here in Washington who said, well, that'll cause democratic states to spend less money. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, and uh, if you look at somebody's income, your income doesn't include the money you have to send to Sacramento in taxes. Uh, home ownership is much more expensive if you can't deduct the property taxes. And uh, that's why I've co-sponsored every bill to try to restore either all or part of. I'd like to do all, settle for part of for a while, uh, the state and local tax deduction. Uh, Mike, thank you for the extra time. Thank you, Congressman Schoen. Congressman Garcia. Uh, so, first of all, let me say thanks again. It's an honor to be here as a former realtor myself. I, I do enjoy these conversations. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, real estate is a, is a passion and a hobby of mine and uh, uh, looking forward to supporting you guys in all ways. Um, and I want to thank Nancy for, uh, again, your, uh, your ambassadorship to our office has been uh, very critical in uh, making sure that we're taking care of uh, our economy and our, frankly, our nation's security. Um, and, and with that, we take care of our realtors and our homeowners as well. Uh, SALT. Uh, first of all, I, I, the first piece of legislation I wrote in this session this last two years was H.R. 202, uh, which is the straight removal of the SALT cap limit. Uh, there are other bills out there. I am a co-sponsor on the other bills. We have uh, bipartisan support for mine. Um, I wrote my bill uh, with, with this intent to just remove this artificial limitation because the numbers are changing on a daily basis. And I think if we start from a position that says, hey, let's double the cap from 10,000 to 20,000, or let's let's make it applicable to certain income levels, uh, because those numbers are changing so dramatically, especially in, a, in an economy with eight to 10% inflation, that we're gonna end up be uh, chasing this problem in perpetuity. And so uh, I think we need to start, at least from a negotiation perspective, from a perspective that we remove this uh, very artificial and, and in my opinion, very limiting uh, salt cap deduction limit altogether. Uh, and then we can negotiate from that position. Uh, I have a problem with some of my colleagues on my side of the aisle who don't think that this is a, a problem for them. Uh, some, some conservatives believe that this is a California problem, that this is a New York problem. Uh, and so we haven't gotten the support of uh, all of the Republicans. There's a few of us that are, that are pushing this very hard. Uh, but they're starting to realize that this is now a, a, a nationwide problem. The average home value in Texas, for instance, has gone from, you know, uh, 250 to now close to 600,000. Their property taxes are actually higher than ours in, uh, in California. So, so when you look at what they're paying in property taxes, they may not have the income tax problem that we have, but they have other taxes. Uh, they're starting to see and realize that this $10,000 limit is really hindering their growth and their economies as well, not just the real estate markets, but all things. Uh, so this is a commitment I've made early on uh, to, to, to fight this fight. Um, I think it also has to be done in parallel with uh, fixing the tax code and, and, and regulations at the, at the state levels as well. Um, and so when we look at, you know, why do we hit this $10,000 cap? Uh, it's not just the cap itself that we need to remove. We need to try to lower our taxes at the state level. Our governor right now in California is touting, I think, a $70 billion surplus. Uh, to me, that that screams uh, tax reductions and, and tax rebates. Uh, that, that doesn't mean you continue to raise our taxes, but that's, that is what is happening in California. And so this aggravates the salt cap limit, especially for Californians. New York feels the same uh, type of uh, issues that we do. So um, we, we've got to keep fighting this fight. This is a nationwide problem, not just a, you know, a, a high-end problem. The other sort of narrative against this uh, uh, salt cap removal is that this is for the wealthy. That's not true, uh, especially in California with the, with the median home prices the way uh, they are right now um, and with our, uh, you know, onerous tax codes uh, in California. Uh, if you are a homeowner and you are working uh, at this point, you are most likely affected by this $10,000 cap, okay? Um, it's, it's an artificial punishment against Californians. Uh, it, was, it was meant to be sort of, a, you know, kind of a uh, thumbing the nose at, the, at California and New York as part of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which otherwise was a, was a good tax bill. It just had the salt cap uh, uh, thing in there that was uh, very punishing towards us. So, um, so it's, it's, it's now middle class, lower income families, if they own a home, if they're dual income family, especially they're, they're hitting this $10,000 limit. 
and it's affecting all households, especially in Southern California, as you guys know. So uh, I'm committed to keep fighting this fight. Uh, we, we've got good support from both sides of the aisles, so we just got to get critical mass. I'm, I'm a little uh, concerned that this hasn't been brought forward. We've been voting on, on everything in the kitchen sink in the last two years, but uh, the majority in, in this case has, has not been bringing this forward. They haven't even been trying to bolt the, the salt cap removal to these other larger spending bills. And I think that's a problem. We've got to figure out how to make this a priority from both sides of the aisle, but then also drive um, uh, sponsorship, drive support and, and get to a yes on this. And uh, I think we'll get there. It's just, uh, it's been frustratingly slow, but um, trust that I, I've been very vocal about this, hopefully, as you guys have been seeing, but uh, that's, that's, a, that's a key element to making sure we can stay in California. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Patty, over to you. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, Con Congressman Sherman and Congressman uh, Garcia. Uh, as, uh, as realtors, we strive to ensure all Americans have the opportunity to achieve home ownership, which we know is the pathway to economic well-being and intergenerational wealth building. However, a historic 50-year record shortage of affordable homes available for purchase has severely limited the access to residential real estate market. A recent study estimates that the United States has developed an underbuilding gap of 5.5 million housing units over the last 20 years. This translates uh, into a $4.4 trillion underinvestment in housing. Uh, even relatively modest steps taken now to reduce uh, this gap would unleash tremendous economic activity and create millions of new jobs. Realtor support legislation like the Housing Supply and Affordability Act and the Neighborhood Home Investment Act, uh, which would offer various tax credits or grants to promote the development of much needed housing. So please tell us what uh, vision you have for your districts to expand housing uh, for low to moderate income, as well as uh, the working middle class. I'm gonna start, uh, ask uh, you, uh, Congressman uh, Garcia, as your district covers um, one of the last remaining affordable housing areas in LA County. Yeah, and no, thank you. Good, good question. I think we've got to look at all contributing factors to this this problem that we have, and I think we also need to recognize that we can't spend our way out of this problem and subsidize our way out of the problem. The, these subsidies are short-term highs. Um, it's like you know, drinking a margarita. It feels good at first. Uh, you crave it. You want it, and then. Uh, as, as you're on the second margarita and you're eating the food and the next day you've got a hangover and you realize it actually uh, makes things worse. And, and that's what a lot of these subsidies do. I'm not opposed to all of the subsidies, but let's look at the root cause of the affordability problem. And, and unfortunately, because of the some of the bills that we've passed in the last two years on the spending side, especially the affordability problem is getting aggravated and we're going in the wrong direction. Um, we're in a, in, in, in a state that, uh, unfortunately, as you guys know, before you're even uh, pouring the foundation, you're, you're in a single family home uh, with a lot, et cetera, the regulations, the, uh, the CEQA, the NEPA, all, all of the, all of the you know, regulatory red tape uh, checks in the box you've got to get for just a single family home, you're in it at, for at least $250,000, $300,000 um, and so that's that's step one. How do we get the foundational cost, pardon the pun, uh, to, to be lower, to be faster, to, to allow the state to make exceptions and waivers uh, to breaking ground on these neighborhoods that are meant to be lower income family homes, uh, multifamily unit uh, homes, change some of the local um, uh, zoning requirements so that we can get uh, you know higher uh, density uh, uh, neighborhoods approved faster. Uh, and incentivize developers to come in and, and build this, this, these neighborhoods. Uh, when you do that, you literally are able to then lop off uh, upwards of, you know, 150 to 200K per unit. And that, that's, that's meaningful movement in the right direction towards affordability. Uh, what we're seeing right now, unfortunately, is because of all of the spending that we've been uh, committing to that, and, and, and this is why I've been voting against these spending bills in, in the last two years, uh, besides the core COVID bills, we needed those. We, we, we had to keep our businesses alive and keep people whole. Uh, but the rest of this $10 trillion, that's, that's what we've obligated, uh, guys, is about $10 trillion in the last, uh, closer to $11 trillion now in the last two years. Uh, 
And when you do that, you uh, obviously generate this inflation beast that we're now uh, under. Uh, and when the inflation beast comes out of his cage, um, the Fed has no choice but to try to rein it in with uh, increasing rates. Uh, when the rates go up, as uh, my colleague uh, Brad uh, Sherman mentioned, uh, rates go up, uh, mortgage rates go up with it. Uh, we're now seeing six and a quarter percent rates. And that is shocking to the system of all levels uh, of income, but especially the lower income families. So we have basically now just removed the ability for lower income families that a good 20, 30 percent of our demographics that we were hoping to get in homes now have zero chance of purchasing homes because of the economics. And it's, and it's very important that we realize that this wasn't just bad luck. These are the results of policies. These are results of behavioral patterns, both out of DC as well as out of Sacramento. And I, I always tell friends and, and folks that I know that, that the economy is like physics with dollar signs, okay? For, for every action, there's a reaction. For everything in motion, it, it sets things in motion around it as well. And um, when you spend like crazy, um, when you don't have the accountability, when you put so much liquidity into the market, you drive inflation. When inflation goes up, it forces the Fed to raise rates in order to combat it. And the reality is, is that what the Fed is doing right now, and you guys know this, this is why we as you know, the folks in the real estate world are, are very nervous right now. We saw this market come to a screeching halt. The Fed, unfortunately, um, in order to impact inflation and actually push inflation down, the Fed rates need to be above inflation. That's, that's old Milton Friedman Economics 101. So while what he's at 4%, the reality is, is that inflation is at 8, 8.5%. And, and, and we can't imagine a world or an economy or a real estate market where the Fed has to raise rates to the 7%. Um, when he does that, mortgage rates end, end up going to 10, 11%, and it starts looking like the 80s all over again. Now, what I think is going to happen is inflation is going to start creeping down. Energy prices have started coming down a little bit, and I think we're going to see inflation come down to 7%. But this Fed's been very vocal about he's going to be keeping his foot on the pedal with uh, if, uh, Fed rate increases. So getting back to the affordability question, we, we've got to stop spending, okay, like drunken sailors in port. I can make that metaphor because I was a sailor myself. Um, we've got to actually start cutting taxes, especially in California. We're overtaxed. Uh, this, this federal government right now and into this house is looking to raise taxes. There's been a few members that have been vocal about that. We should be lowering taxes. We should be incentivizing people to uh, get back to work, get back, uh, in, you know, uh, to being pro product, uh, productive in the, in the terms of the supply chain. Um, and then we need to re remo be removing these artificial caps like salt, like we talked about. But we've hit a ceiling, right? And, and you guys know it's very, very few people when they buy their first home are looking at the value of the home necessarily. They're looking at their monthly payment. And, and when you hit that threshold of pain for, from a monthly payment perspective, whether it's PITI, uh, you know, with the HOA fees, with the Melarus fees on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if you can't depreciate, if you can't write off, those aggravate it. But we have all time high home prices and we've got the inflation or the, 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 uh, the, the, the lending rates spiking like they are right now. So that, that's, that ceiling has been breached and we are literally seeing 20, 30% of the buyers just go all stop and and not buy a house right now. And, and frankly, that's rational until rates come down, until values pull back a little bit. Uh, and this is why we don't do the things we have done in the last two years. We end up in this this hangover mentality. But I know it's a long answer to your very good question, but um, we, we've got to remove regulation, cut taxes, uh, remove the salt cap, uh, stop spending, and this market will normalize. Supply and demand will get back to normal, hopefully. Uh, Inventory is picking up already a little bit. And uh, when that happens, I think you'll see prices come down. They will become affordable. And we've got to be able to build without being oppressed for building. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman Sherman, um, first of all, we want to thank you for your support on HR 2143 and HR 2126. And can you tell us what you are working on uh, in the San Fernando Valley? Well, ultimately, there's a limited amount of land and a lot of people who want to live in our area. And if we don't change some of the zoning and allow people to build two, three story buildings, even four story buildings, you're going to have incredible costs. You're gonna have people who even are employed who can't afford an apartment. And uh, we've got a, a zoning uh, regimen 
uh, that says don't build anything or build only, you know, four houses, five houses per acre. You can't, however, have any more density unless you have transit, and you cannot have transit unless you have a bit more density. Without some apartment buildings, without some condos, there aren't enough riders to support a rail system. And without a rail system, if you have more people, you've got more people on the 405. So a key thing is building a uh, rail through the Sepulveda Pass and allowing uh, apartments to be constructed, allowing condos to be constructed, uh, especially near a train station. Um, then you, you, you have an affordability crisis in our area that you don't have in Omaha. You don't have in Indianapolis. Uh, you don't even have to, the degree we have it in, uh, in some major cities around the country. And that's because you're going to have to, it's pure supply and demand. If we cannot supply more housing, uh, and we have the demand, uh, the price goes through the roof. And uh, people can't buy a home. Some people can't even rent a home. As to the general economic circumstance, we do have to deal with inflation. We're not going to see a Fed rate at 8%. We're not going to see uh, uh, mortgage rates at 11 or 12%. But uh, we are going to see some tightening. Uh, the latest Inflation uh, Reduction Act bill that we passed uh, people attack it as being a spending bill. It reduces the federal deficit by $300 billion. And uh, it provides lower costs on pharmaceuticals. It is ridiculous that uh, Americans pay triple for the same pharmaceuticals what Europeans pay. And this is a first step toward that. That will reduce inflation. That helps our whole economy, including, including housing. And, uh, uh, and you know, people are against taxes, but uh, if you lower taxes for those businesses that are uh, uh, reducing their carbon footprint and you raise taxes for those businesses that are exploiting tax loopholes and not even paying 15% on their book income, uh, that isn't, that's a tax change, but it's not a tax increase. So um, again, reducing our, our, uh, our budget deficit uh, by $300 billion over 10 years to over 2 trillion over 20 years is an important step. Uh, I wish this bill had been passed on a bipartisan basis. It was passed, uh, uh, unfortunately, in an, uh, on a unipartisan basis. So um, we need to deal with inflation. We need to deal with zoning. Uh, and then, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I support uh, the NAR position on a host of bills designed to incentivize the building of affordable housing, but I will agree with Mike. We can't, uh, we're talking, as the Senator said, uh, uh, 6.8 million. Uh, one of the questioners uh, said 5 million. We, we need well over 5 million additional homes built, and there aren't enough tax incentives to get those built. What we need are lower interest rates and zoning and 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 uh, and a fee structure at the local level that allows people to build uh, uh, units that people can afford. Thank you, Congressman. Back to you, Bob. Thank you, Patty. Uh, commercial real estate has been amongst the hardest hit industries, but exhibits greatest potential post COVID nineteen. Realtors support reforms that ease lending restrictions in the commercial sector and prioritize extending and enhancing loan programs. The pandemic has created shifts in the commercial market, especially in the office and retail sectors. We see great promise in creating much needed housing in the greater Los Angeles area through two bills, the Revitalizing Downtown Act, which is HR 4759, and which creates a qualified office conversion tax credit to convert unused office buildings into residential, commercial, and mixed use properties. And the Greater Revitalization of Shopping Centers Act, which is HR 5041, which will incentivize public and private investment in abandoned and underutilized shopping malls. 
Congressman Sherman, you uh, had made a reference to this, and, and these bills are a little complicated. Where do you stand on repurposing and revitalizing commercial building to build much needed housing, and where do you see this headed? Well, I'm a co-sponsor and have been for many months of both pieces of legislation. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to need uh, more Republican support to get these bills over the finish line. And as important as they are, they don't solve the whole problem. They don't solve half the problem, but they are important steps. When you mentioned commercial real estate, uh, I led the effort to try to stop uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board from requiring lessees to capitalize uh, their, uh, their leases. And that was a, uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to get my colleagues very interested in these accounting issues. But if you look at people who uh, own and operate um, uh, uh, shopping centers and other commercial buildings, uh, they will tell you that that change in the accounting rules was, uh, was, was really harmful. It penalizes those companies that sign long-term leases. And without the long-term lease from the anchor tenant, you really can't make a building or a, or a shopping center go. So uh, I'm hoping to, uh, to generate more interest in these accounting issues because I see the, the benefits and the harms that they, they, they can have uh, on, our, on our real estate economy. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, uh, NAR and CAR and Southland for supporting these two bills, and we're going to try to get them across the finish line. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you for highlighting fast speed because that is now coming to the fore with these bills. Congressman Garcia, your comments? Yeah, I, uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I think we've got two side bets here, uh, Brad, uh, on uh, whether the Inflation Reduction Act will actually lower inflation. I think there was a lot of fuzzy math on that, uh, the, the 300 billion or so that we were asserting was uh, removing the, uh, or, or being removed from the deficit spending. Uh, and then whether or not we get close to 10% rate. So just uh, competitive little side, fun, well, fun side bets uh, we'll take uh, on those, but uh, we can well, save that. Uh, I, I, the, the side bet on the effect it'll have over 10 or 20 years, I don't know if we'll ever agree to a conclusion, but I'll give you a bet now. I don't think the Fed rate is going uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, 8 to to over 8% uh, on, on short-term money. And uh, no, I, nor do I, nor do I. I think that, okay. I think we see mortgage rates approach 10 percent, though, as a function of Fed rates uh, getting getting uh, higher uh, over the course of the next. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a year or two, but it's, it is staggering to see the, the, the lending rates have gone up 100 percent in the last eight months. So, uh, to, you know, we're only about 40 percent or so from that that 10 percent mark on the mortgage rate. So it's, it's very sure scary to we... see the rate of change. We, we we could hit ten percent for a short period of time, but if you draw if you, if, if the bet is eleven, I'll take the bet. <laughs> right, it's good. not going to hit eleven. I'll do an over under cut line. Yep. Uh, as far as the the commercial uh, building uh, issue, I I think there is hope here. I think there are good solutions here. Um, I, and I echo uh, Brad's comments. Um, uh, I'm not opposed to incentivizing from a federal government these projects or, or matching investments. Um, from either commercial or private investors into these buildings, I, I think it does start with the local uh, cities and the and the state uh, regulations. Um, we've got to make sure that these aren't destined to die on the vine. Before you know, we can't just say, "Hey, I'm going to give you a million dollar offset for your million dollar investment into this commercial property." We've got to also make sure, you know, and like in our case, that the city of Lancaster and the city of Palmdale are okay with that. That the owner of the development uh, and the building is on, okay with it and, it, and it can't be mandated or forced, and that's that's where I get a little squeamish on these projects. Is if 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 Big Brother's coming downrange and telling uh, the commercial property owner that they have to convert or that the zoning is being compelled to change for whatever reason, um, but I but I think those are doable dues, and I I think we can get there, um, but but it is. As a federalist, I believe the lower left, the lowest levels of government are the most important, and that they understand their neighborhoods the best. And I think we've got to have the, the the local city councils, neighborhood councils, town councils on board with these initiatives before we we get too far downrange using tax federal taxpayer money to to, to augment it. But uh, I do see great opportunity there. There's a lot of space, especially in the in this pivot. 
I will caveat it though, and I just came from an economic uh, development center brief uh, here in Santa Clarita this morning, where they're they're seeing this. In during COVID, everyone pivoted to remote working, and so there was less demand on the commercial spaces, and a lot of these larger businesses were were vacating their commercial spaces. Um, but that's starting to change. You're starting to see companies now change their policies. There's only now about a quarter of the companies that are even open to some level of remote remote uh, working. And I think a lot of people are saying, you got to come back to work, okay? Um, we, we're losing out on productivity and efficiencies. So there, all that to say that there may now be a, 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 an increase coming again for commercial spaces, especially office spaces, but industrial warehouses, the, some of these larger facilities that have just been abandoned or shopping malls that are just obsolete, um, you know, maybe they are good opportunities for additional uh, uh, multifamily uh, units. But again, if you don't remove all the regulations, if you don't remove all of the, the red tape and the cost that goes into facilitizing and, and, and you know, getting these zoned correctly, uh, then we're just starting at square one all over again. But um, I, I do support the, the paradigm. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you for uh, bringing out uh, the, the it's slight tick up in the absorption rate in Santa Cruz on commercial. Uh, Patty, over to you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, since 1921, tax law has recognized the exchange of one investment for a business use property for another of like kind. Uh, like kind exchanges provide the flexibility to shift investments to the most promising uses and retain uh, capital for expansion and job creation. This flexibility is badly needed at this time of crisis for commercial real estate. However, some have suggested that the 1031 like-kind exchange is an unwarranted loophole and should be repealed. We believe that preservation of the 1031 exchange, <clears throat> deferred exchange adds to the federal tax revenue and boosts local real estate investments. 60% of all 1031 exchanges are completed in California. Con Congressman Garcia, do you support the 1031 exchange and has there been discussion among your colleagues uh, about eliminating or modifying it? Uh, so yeah, I support it. I use them. Um, I, I think they are a very valuable tool. Um, it, it has several net benefits. So one, it's not a ta it's not tax evasion, right? This, this notion that you're not paying taxes on these is a fallacy. Eventually, you sell a property that you've rebased into and you've rolled into. Um, there's, there's good limitations, there's restrictions on how you do it. So it is regulated. And in fact, 1031 exchanges, as you guys know, are probably one of the most regulated after the fact uh, of, of all tax laws and, and uh, issues out there. So you are hawked very closely to make sure that you're following through. And if you're not following through, you you pay the taxes on, on your property that you sold, right? So ultimately we sell the properties um, and you realize that the, the revenue from you know all levels of government at that point. And usually the values have gone up and the tax rates in California usually go up. So you're actually recognizing higher revenue and it's on the heels of depreciating the, the, the property itself, right? So you, the, all that becomes... Uh, taxable as you depreciate 127th or whatever the ratios are for the states um, of the land over time. So um, from a revenue perspective, this is to say that it's 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 some form of the, the wealthy and the investors to dodge uh, taxes is just wrong. Uh, it's also an incentive for investors to continue to stay in the market. And, and right now there's a lot of headwinds for investors right now. There's a lot of reasons to cash out and not get involved, especially in California, especially in Southern California. And what the 1031 does is it incentivizes, and in some cases, I would say it compels them to stay in and, and keep buying properties, uh, to keep in, in improving their their portfolios, and to continue to provide housing. I, I know me personally, I you know I, I provide uh, uh, single family residents uh, uh, with affordable rent uh, with my rental properties, and and um, you know I've been able to do that because of of some of these uh, tools that we have as investors. Uh, without raising the rents on my tenants for 10 years, for for instance. And so uh, I think we need to keep it. Is there discussions among my colleagues of removing it? Yes, uh, it, it is being threatened uh, by, uh, you know, I I, it, I I haven't heard conservatives talk about removing this, um, but I have heard Dems uh, talk about removing the 1031. That's not me throwing spears. I'm just reporting the facts. Uh, there's legislation out there and there's tax codes and uh, I don't sit on uh, Mr. Sherman's committee, so I don't know the, the details of those conversations, but I think we've got to keep advocating for 1031. I think it's very important. Um, and I think uh, the investors, especially, it's not just these big commercial development, you know, corporations and, 
investors. These are in many cases, mom and pop, single family resident uh, investment properties. And they're just trying to stay whole. They're just trying to continue to rent. They want to stay in this business and in this world of investment property and have liquidity with it. And the 1031 uh, enables that. So, um, uh, that, you know, that's that's the short answer. I can go on and on about it. Uh, I've done it myself and uh, I appreciate the value of them, of course. Thank you. So, uh, Congressman Sherman, um, what are your thoughts on the 1031 exchange? I don't think there's uh, any serious attack on 1031. I've supported it overall. On the other hand, I think it's important that the capital gain, if it's deferred, eventually be taxed. And the uh, the step up in basis at death uh, can create a circumstance where you use 1031 to defer, and then at some point it escapes taxation overall. But I think the better the uh, uh, I, I think as long as the gain is taxed at some point, uh, a, I've seen situations where people um, who should be disposing of property because they don't plan to develop it, they don't plan to use it, uh, they boarded it up, and they're waiting for somebody to die, so it gets up a step up in basis, and uh, a a 1031 uh, approach to that. Uh, we had a, 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 a property when I represented Tahunga that had been boarded up for years, uh, waiting for someone to die. And uh, 1031 would have been the answer to that. I'm uh, annoyed that the owners of the property didn't do a 1031 on, on, on that property. So um, uh, I, I think an overall, you know, I think 1031s uh, have been very helpful in some circumstances. And at the same time, a system where capital gain never gets taxed is, is one you've got to get away from. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I we Bob, there's a question in the Q&A. Can you see that? Would you be willing to uh, ask that? We have enough time. Wait, you're on mute, Bob. I don't think Bob knows. Bob, you're on mute. Unmute yourself, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm getting old. Uh, the life of loan MMI charge and MMI stands for mutual mortgage insurance on FHA loans isn't fair and holds off many of my buyers. This is from the questionnaire. Can be an extra $600 a month. Can you see about getting FHA to change the MMI to be the same as PMI, which is removed when 20% equity based on the original sales price? And uh, you can go first, Congressman Garcia. Yeah, let me, uh, if I can ask a clarifying question is, is MMI uh, at the purchase a function of the loan to value ratio like, like PMI is? So then, yeah, I, this makes sense. Um, if that's the case, once you get below the, the threshold for, for whatever triggers it, you know, if it's 20% equity or whatever, uh, that, that should come off. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's already something in work that, that you guys have uh, going forward, but if if there isn't, we should we should try to pull something together to see if we can uh, lean on FHA a little bit um, to to uh, adjust this. But uh, I think we I think for me, it, it, you know, this is this is onerous and it shouldn't be a uh, true life of loan if it is in fact that. Thank you, Congressman Sean. Yeah, in general, uh, mortgage insurance uh, is a, uh, is something that you can ask people to have until they have an appropriate equity in the property. And uh, uh, I, I I look forward to uh, NAR uh, putting forward a proposal here uh, to to achieve fairness. Thank you. Um, we're going to do a wrap up, but before we do, we have a couple minutes left. So I would like to ask you, Congressman Sherman, is there anything that you wish to bring to our attention and how we can help you? And then after you, we'll go to Congressman Garcia. I uh, didn't know you'd have a couple extra minutes. I <laughs> want to acknowledge uh, my key contact, Alice McCain. And uh, uh, but I, I see, I, I could acknowledge everybody on the screen. I've known you all for many years. Um, I, uh, I would say that uh, we do have to bring down the federal deficit uh, and, we do, and, and uh, we do have to deal with inflation. Uh, and uh, our decision to uh, uh, increase the IRS is an important part of that because we have a circumstance where wage earners are paying their taxes. They're not necessarily more honest people than people with more complicated uh, lives, but 
You get a W-2 form, copy goes to the IRS, your 1099s go to the IRS. Uh, what this bill we just passed did raises the number of IRS employees to the same level as under Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan believed that we should have a, uh, a one IRS employee for about every 3,000 Americans. And uh, this bill will do that. If we don't do that, then uh, the income tax was moving in a direction where it was uh, being paid by wage earners and uh, too many, uh, too high a percentage of those with, uh, with wealth and complicated uh, lives uh, were, uh, were not paying. And so I think that's the single most important step to me, winning my bet with Mike Garcia that uh, this bill will indeed re re reduce inflation. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Garcia? No, thanks, Brad. You highlighted the funny math for me. Thanks. I don't have to talk about it anymore. Uh, all right. So I think we got to get back to uh, Economics 101. I think we, you know, we this is scary times. We don't know where these charts, you know, it's just like the stock market when, when things are going poorly. You don't know where the bottom is. In this case, we don't know where the top of rates are, where the top of inflation is. And uh, we've all just got to do our part. This isn't a Republican versus Democrat thing. This is about the economy. This is about, you know, physics with dollar signs. I think if we go after the job creators, if we go after the businesses that, that bring the industries to our valleys, um, in my case, we have a large aerospace and defense uh, footprint out here. But if we go after them and we disincentivize them, then, then we will lose jobs in the local area. And that's, that to me is the key, right? It, 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 if, it, it, if, the IRS may not come after you because you make less than a certain dollar value, but you may actually lose your job because uh, the, 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 these, these regulations, these taxes are disincentivizing people from investing in our communities. So uh, it's, it, for me, it's all about security. It's all about economic security, neighborhood security. We've got to have neighborhoods that people want to move to where they can have a job, where they can afford the home. Uh, and that's that's literally the role of not just the federal government, but all of our elected officials to provide that security and not necessarily provide for an outcome, but to make sure that everyone has equal access to the tools to get to the outcome that they desire. And that that to me is the American way. So you guys, you guys got my commitment. Uh, I'll, I'll stand behind your initiatives as, as long as they uh, don't aggravate problems, as long as we're uh, trying to cut spending, lower rates, uh, incentivize people to uh, home ownership. Um, I think we need to have a conversation at some point about the difference between affordability and, and the homeless problem. I think it's dangerous to conflate those two issues. Um, one does aggravate the other, if not correctly done well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, home ownership uh, is, is different than homelessness and, and, and being able to provide rental properties and, and um, higher density housing that folks can rent uh, is just as important as um, the, the, the affordability of home ownership, if that makes sense. But that's a different conversation for another day. So I appreciate what you all have done, especially through COVID. Uh, you guys have been the catalyst uh, for, for keeping families uh, whole through the, this very difficult time. And uh, I appreciate the partnership and as always appreciate Nancy, your communications and um, uh, friendship and uh, partnership through this as well. So uh, thank you guys and, and appreciate the invitation. And uh, I, I want to thank the members of uh, Southland Realtors for allowing me to sell my home, which is now in Mike Garcia's district. <laughs> uh, I think. Are you moving before November ballots come out, Brad? What's going I, on? I, I moved before the primary. So oh, okay. I didn't vote for you. I didn't vote against you. I voted for me. <laughs> Uh, but, um, uh, uh, and I now live in America's best named city. Once again, Sherman Oaks, <laughs> uh, I did not require the person who bought the home to tell me how they would vote in your election. <laughs> good. That would be illegal. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so Boy, I, look you. I look forward to working with uh, all of you and, uh, I want to thank you for your dedication to, uh, allow people to become home owners, to, to make it in the middle class, uh, to develop some family wealth. And uh, uh, I look forward to working with you for, for many years and uh, uh, being uh, on the Financial Services Committee uh, allows me to do that in an important way. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you both of you gentlemen for helping us with our goal to protect home ownership. 
and our industry, because we all obviously feel that this is critical to our economy being healthy. Um, I wanna say a special thank you to both Congressman Sherman and Congressman Garcia for coming on and being with us and answering all our questions. And I'd like to say thank you for the videos that we got uh, through Mel and Loretta for Senator Padilla and Congressman Cardenas. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank you to all the people that are watching. We have over a hundred people out there who are watching today. And um, thank you to those of you that are on the screen today because those of us at, with South End Regional, we've spent many, many years working in this area, in this arena. And uh, without your dedication, uh, we wouldn't be doing as well as we are. So um, I also wanna say thank you to Diane Seidel and Gina Uzunian. It was their brainchild to start doing these federal forums. And we are going to be continuing. So next year, we're gonna be thanking you, Jeff, our president this year for doing the same. So, um, and remember the realtors are here. If you have any questions uh, on our positions and you know, we're, we have wonderful relationships with you. You both have championed things for us and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. So this was truly a pleasure having you here and some of your staff members have joined in. So um, to keep you up to date uh, on our texting alerts for those of you that are uh, realtors, this is the number you text realtors to 30644 um, and this will keep you in the know. Um, and also um, if there's anything else that Elizabeth wants to add, she has been wonderful in organizing this with us and uh, she is our glue that keeps us together. So many, many thanks to Elizabeth. Anything further? All right, then we can adjourn and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank Have a good you. one, guys.